Good evening. I am Justa Encarnacion, your Commissioner of Health, and thank you for joining us on the Press Box. This is a break from us talking at you and an opportunity to speak with you. This month is National Diabetes Awareness Month, and today we want to raise awareness about the risk factors that many face for developing this chronic condition. People of color are disproportionately affected by diabetes. Approximately 12% of Virgin Islanders suffer from some form of this disease. It's important that you know the risk factors for type 1, type 2, and gestational diabetes. Joining me for this discussion is our First Lady, Yolanda Bryan, and our first daughter, Aaliyah Bryan, to tell us about their personal journey and with diabetes. Later in the show, we will be joined by Acting Director of Chronic Disease and Prevention, Dr. Linnea Fredericks, and a registered nurse, Desiree James, who is one of two certified diabetes educators in the territory. But before we begin, let me bring you up to date on the COVID-19 cases and vaccinations. As of the 21st, we actually have tested 219,324 individuals, of which 7,466 have been positive, testing negative 211,858. The last testing we did was 759, and 20 of those individuals have been positive, which actually brings our seven-day positivity up to 2.39. It is actually creeping up, so we have to be careful. Our active cases territory-wide right now is 94, which has been shown no increase within the last 24 to 48 hours. Our recovered cases, 7,287, which fortunately we've seen 19 of those recovered. Our fatality remains at 85, and we continue to pray for those who have lost their loved ones. From a, looking at from an island-specific perspective, St. Croix had 19 of those positive cases, bringing our active cases to 81. St. Thomas had only one positive active cases now at 12. And St. John had no positive active cases as one. And I always say it is some comfort to know that St. Thomas, St. John is doing fairly well. Water Island is doing excellent. St. Croix, not so much, but I do, it's a difference between having comfort with those numbers and being comfortable with those numbers. So I wanna make sure that we're not as comfortable as we seem to be these days. Please continue to do what you need to do to decrease our COVID numbers. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about your vaccinations and what we're doing right now. For those of you who listened to the Monday press conference, I spoke a little bit about Latinos, black and brown individuals, actually increasing the number of vaccinations throughout the nation. In Puerto Rico, their percentage of vaccinations is way above 80 at this point in time. I think they should be commended for that. We too have that capability. We just have to go out and become vaccinated. Right now, 12 and over, we're looking at fully vaccinated, 51,760, which is about 57.90%. 18 and over, which is 49,277 individuals vaccinated, that's 60. 44%. We're creeping up. We're not doing that bad. And of course, 65 and over, that's about a population of 17,737. You see that the, num the denominators are going down and our numbers are going up in terms of our age limit. 65 and over, look, listen to this. 14,629 of those have been vaccinated, which brings that population fully vaccinated to 824 Eight percent. Imagine. Huh? I think that that is a very, very commendable. One of the things that one of the things that we will be discussing is what does diabetes have to do with COVID? I ask another way. What does COVID have to do with diabetes? We'll come back and have that discussion. But what are you saying, Jimmy? Me turn a hot minute. What going on today, John? It's been a hot minute for a reason. You want to know something? My mother tell me that I can't come out my house for the COVID-19. I know we ain't safe out here for a little bit, but still I just have some fun though. Well, my say can't leave the house unless I'm vaccinated. But you won't get the vaccine? No, nah, sis. The vaccine safe. VIP people, you must stay awake. COVID-19 is not a joke. It's much more than good hygiene. Give your children the vaccine. Education is the golden rule. Children need and 
rehearse in school They miss music, dancing and sports Vaccination is better not worse I want the COVID vaccine Give me the COVID vaccine They save mommy The vaccine save, save, save I want to see my friends and family Playing with them makes me happy It save mommy The vaccine save, save, save Children can become infected, get sick and spread COVID to others. Widespread vaccination is a critical tool to help stop the pandemic. People who are fully vaccinated can resume activities that they did prior to the pandemic. The MCH division encourages you to get your children ages 12 years and older vaccinated. I want the COVID vaccine. Give me the COVID vaccine. They save mommy. The vaccine save, save, save. Brought to you by the Virgin Islands Department of Health MCH program. When you're deaf or hard of hearing, operating a vehicle presents a unique set of challenges. If you're pulled over by the police, please follow these directions. Using your left hand, hold your communication accommodation visor card outside the driver's window in plain sight for the officer to see. Indicate to the officer the best way to communicate with you. The officer will then use this method to alert you for the reason of your traffic stop and what you need to provide. Be sure to follow all the officer's instructions to ensure a safe and calm interaction. To obtain a communication accommodation visa card for drivers who are deaf or hard of hearing, please contact the Virgin Islands Bureau of Motor Vehicles at 774-4268 on St. Thomas, 713-4268 on St. Croix, or 776-6262 on St. John. Sponsored by the Disability Rights Center of the Virgin Islands. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, you. Hey, babe. Thanks for lunch. You're welcome. Who was that? That was a representative from the Virgin Islands Department of Health. They're doing a survey called BRFSS. Oh, for what? It's to address chronic diseases facing the Virgin Islands. Diabetes, heart and kidney disease, cancer, stroke, and more. What kind of questions do they ask? They ask questions about food, exercise, age, smoking, and some others. Is that all they ask? Do they ask questions about... Security? No. They don't ask anything about social security, money, or credit card information. The information that they do collect is used to guide public health programs that affect all of us. You, me, the kids, the community, and the entire Virgin Islands. Oh, okay. Very interesting. I'm glad we could do our part to help. Yes, we've got to do our part. For more information, visit our website or call John Orr at 340-643. 5422. Welcome back. As we told you, this is Diabetes Awareness Month. And along with COVID, we always have to consider other things that happen during the COVID pandemic. And di diabetes is one of the conditions that actually can affect how you react to the virus. And um, so we'll be discussing that a little bit more later because we have some experts that's going to be joining us on the panel. But before we go there, like I said, we have our first lady and our first daughter here with us, Salia and Yolanda. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Of it's course. A pleasure. I, I speak with you and I actually just got goosebumps as I was speaking because one of the things that, that we're discussing is, is diabetes, but not just diabetes, but really and truly family. Right, right. And, it, and diabetes does affect families Correct. Um, in, in, in really major ways. It certainly affected ours in a major way. And how? How is that? You know, so... It, it, it wasn't something that I was familiar with. Um, it was, um, you know, when, when, um, when it happened, when Aaliyah was diagnosed, it was, um, I, I just I had not no one in my family had diabetes. Um, I really was pretty um, ignorant about diabetes, much less diabetes type one, type two, gestational. I didn't know what it, I, I, I didn't know what it meant. And um, so when the physicians, um, you know, diagnosed her and started, you know, talking about the various things and the mm -hmm. scale and the, you know, and the honeymoon period and the, you know, all these, th all these things that, you know, were coming my way, our way. Uh, I, I just, you know, I just didn't, it was like Greek. So how did you talk about feelings? 
Just, just stop and just think. What was the first feeling that when someone said to you, Aliyah is actually is diabetes, a diabetic. She has diabetes. What was your first feeling, your first thought? My very first thought was, my, of course, my daughter, my daughter's health. Mm -hmm. But there was an extreme guilt that I had. Like, I thought that it was something that I did while I was pregnant. You know, what did I do? Mm -hmm. um, because, like I said before, I, I, hadn't, I had no knowledge whatsoever. And, and, and as a mother, I think that would probably be the first thought, especially if there's, they're saying it's type 1. Right. What's your understanding of type 1 diabetes? So type 1 diabetes, uh, there were two things that came my way. Um, and and I, not, well, I know um, that uh, the, the type or form of diabetes that Aaliyah has is very much genetic. Um, because it's, there is a prevalence in her father's on her father's side of the, uh, mm -hmm. the family, um, and um, and that it, it's an autoimmune deficiency, um, and that it can um, there's there's some research that says it can be brought on by a viral virus, yes. um, and so that's that's what I've gained throughout this knowledge that I've gained throughout the years. So let's let's um, roll. This is now 2021, yeah. and you've learned a lot about diabetes. Yeah, I'm a Google doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Many of us, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've learned a lot about diabetes. Sure. And if you were supposed to tell other mothers out there, uh, I've, I've, I'm a pediatric nurse. Um, oh, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. and we've actually had um, children come to us. I think the youngest I've seen a diagnosis six months. That's yeah. pretty young. Extremely. Um, right, but it has happened. So what do you t say to parents out there, not just mothers, but fathers and guardians for, for their little ones being diagnosed with diabetes? You know, my, my, my first thing was, you know, just, you know, try and, and exercise patience. Um, be calm, because you have to be calm for your child. You know, if you, if you if you're, if you're look stressed, that stress is gonna translate or transfer to your child. Mm -hmm. Um, ask the necessary questions. Don't be afraid to ask, even if you think it's, you know, just not the right question. There's no dumb question to ask. Um, you know, just go with all your questions, do your research. Go out there and do as much research as you can so that you can, you can educate yourself on, on you know, what it, what it means. Um, it, and there's various amounts of doctors, but you know, form your own sort of village, your support network. Good. I mm -hmm. would say, you know, look at the foods that you bring into your house. I know when I went to the grocery store, it was, you know, I, I, I must have been there for hours when, you know, especially when it was just, I've, I've always oh, been sort of like this, this health freak, but I'm doing, you know, always on one thing or the other. But, you know, when this happened, it, it, it just, it, it took an inordinate amount of time, especially in the grocery store, you know, because I was told, oh, well, you know, you can't, you shouldn't bring in anything that has over eight grams of sugar, you know, and so I was busy in the grocery store going like, oh, looking at all the nutritional labels, and so it took forever, I'm, and I'm not saying that, you know, you do all of that, but wholesome food. Okay, so let me take you from there. Now, you've done so much research and so much Google, and you're a health fanatic. So now I'm hearing some good things. You're taking all of that knowledge and that experience, yeah. and what are you doing with it? I'm hearing about a book coming out. Right, up. right. So there's this, um, and it's, it's, it's uh, COVID kind of put us, set us back a little bit, um, but the, the, the thought was, and it's for children, um, and well, it's for families, but primarily children that um, that the thought is to, to to get them to eat a little bit better by dispelling the sort of these aversions that they may have, okay. mm -hmm. um, and have there these recipes that will bring them into the kitchen to, with the help of an older a sibling or you know, an adult that create we could create these great snacks, because it's not rusted, it's not, you know, it's anything that you really have to, it, intensive, but um, creating, by creating these, these snacks, um, for example, there's one that, I don't want to divulge too much, but, you know, you, you create a, a, a boat, 
a sailboat out mm -hmm. of vegetables oh, okay. you know mm -hmm. and so you know in so doing you know so they might be their food. so they're playing with their and food they're, they're having them. fun mm -hmm. um there's an educational component to it so you're measuring you know you're learning your measurements and all this on the other and um I, I think it's a great way to interact in the household uh, with your and parents incorporate children into right what they're doing. right right so um you know it's the, the learning component they'll be we're hoping to have some crossword puzzles so there's li there's Excellent. reading in there and um so there are about and then and then i want some some of the recipes if not most of them um resonate culturally oh, so I that, like that you know there's this yeah. You know the recipes aren't so far so far off. Yeah. Um, so you got some fungi in there? No fungi. No <laughs> fungi. No fungi. That's but, you know, some that's little some little Jason. some little ice pops that okay. don't have oh, like sugar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fruit as you know is uh, yeah. you know mm -hmm. has sugar in it, natural sugar. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited, and um, we're just plugging. We got some, no. a lot of the content. Good. Now, um, as Alia was a baby. Right, I know she was diagnosed at 12. But um, tell us a little bit, because we're gonna be speaking with her and I just want a little glimpse as to how she was as a baby and growing up and then uh, a little bit more questions, but tell us, how was she as a baby? So Aaliyah was, oh my gosh, so she was two weeks late. I remember doc, Dr. Carr, <laughs> God rest his soul, um, but he was amazing. I loved him as a physician. Um, and uh, so, you know, and I just, she didn't want to come out. She was quite happy. Um, she called, remember the day he called me and we went to the hospital and didn't, you know, went on the Pitocin, Pitocin, and Pitocin. It, it didn't, nothing happened and rolled into the ER and had to have a, a C-section eventually. And um, out came this beautiful nine, nine pound, 12 ounce baby. Um, I remember that distinctively. Aliyah um, said, oh, she did yes, not no, just she did. <laughs> no, she didn't. No, she didn't. But she's, you know, beautiful. And, and, and um, she was just a great baby. She didn't, didn't cry much. Um, you know, I remember just, just, you know, just her always being her demeanor, always calm. And, and she, calm. she maintained that calmness she, as she grew. She, so what, she what um, caused you to think that something was wrong? Uh, you know, it happened rather, there wasn't like, there wasn't a series, it did, they, I, there wasn't anything that happened over time that I could see. Um, I could, I could tell you it was the summer. I, I could tell you, I could, I distinctively remembered there were these forms that you have to, you have to fill out before you go to mm -hmm. school. You know, you got to make sure your immunizations are in order and you got to make sure that, you know, you're, you know, that department of health, they just. They, they, they just, they just get it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, so I went to the doctor and, um, and, but she had ha she had been having within the last week prior to going to the doctor, um, you know, just a, a lethargy, you know, sleeping. She was staying with my mother, you know, and um, I think summer camp had just finished. Mm -hmm. So she was, she was at mom's house. And uh, so I remember my mother coming out and telling me, look, she drank these two gallons of water. And I kind of went like, that's kind of strange. So, you know, go to the doctor. Right. Dr. Roman was yes. her physician. Who's still Roman. Mm -hmm. Who's still Roman. Mm -hmm. He's great. And, and I, I began to explain to him what was happening. Yeah. And he immediately ordered these um, lab works. We were in the office. He told us not to leave. The lab work came in positive. She yeah. had over 800, some ridiculous amount of uh, glucose mm -hmm. in her urine and, and in her blood. We went immediately to the ER, admitted, and there, I think she was there for about a week and a half, two weeks, yeah. Okay, well, we'll be speaking with Aliyah so she can give us our perspective because when you're 12 years old or, or very close to being 12, you have a completely different perspective oh, yeah. of ha uh, hospitals, physicians, nurses, and that can have an impact on your life from Absolutely. the very beginning. So diagnosing um, diabetes is one thing. Diagnosing, mm -hmm. treating, and having, I'm going, you spoke about that family support is critical. It is. And see, so we're exactly where we need to go and what we need to do 
um, to help other family members cope with diabetes. Absolutely. I, I really want to thank you for sharing your feelings and your thoughts. Um, before we go, though, what would you want to say to the general public in reference to diabetes? You know, Just in general. Yeah. Bring in awareness. I, 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 I would say to the general public, it's important to, you know, for, for type 1 and type 2, um, and they're distinctively different, mm -hmm. as, as you know. Um, you know, nutrition is very, very important. Um, you know, um, eating the way, in fact, eating the way a diabetic eats is the way we we Gosh. we should we should eat, um, and that's you know small portions, about six times a day, and um, and and incorporating your fibers and your healthy greens and uh, and um, you know not necessarily eliminating, but uh, making mindful decisions on what you consume in terms of you know your sugary sweets. And we can leave out that exercise portion and the exercise and, over, and overall wellness. And exercise, and we know that all too yeah, well. Thank in you our so much, that, really thank and you. truly. Uh, I know that it hasn't been easy for you um, speaking about it, but I, I just really want to thank you, and I'm looking forward to hear what Alia has to say in, in her experiences in diabetes. One thing I'd like also like to, to to say is that I'd like to offer my 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 support to the Department of Health and, and oh, mothers um, that have children that have diabetes. Um, it's it's not easy, and and they they really need parents need the support, and they need a role model. And and the good thing is that yeah. is that Linia Fedrix is here listening yeah. to you. Yeah, and she's gonna take you up on that. And I will I as want well. her to. And I, I will. I want. As well. <laughs> thank you okay. too. Thank so. you so much. I really appreciate it. But, and and the children need th that that support. support as well. And and do it in a way that it's fun. Exactly. You know, because learning can be fun. Thank you so much. Don't go away. We'll be back to speak with Aliyah. But what are you saying, Jimmy? It means you're in a hot minute. What's going on today, John? It's been a hot minute for a reason. You want to know something? My mother told me that I can't come out my house for the COVID-19. I know we ain't safe out here for a little bit, but still, I don't have some fun, though. Well, my say can't leave the house and get vaccinated. But you will get the vaccine? Nah, sis. The vaccine says. VIP, but you must stay at work. COVID-19 is not a joke. It's much more than good hygiene. Give your children the vaccine. Education is the golden rule. Children need in person school. They miss music, dancing, and sports. Vaccination is better than worse. I want the COVID vaccine. Give me the COVID vaccine. They save mommy. The vaccine save, save, save. Children can become infected, get sick, and spread COVID-19 to others. Widespread vaccination is a critical tool to help stop the pandemic. People who are fully vaccinated can resume activities that they did prior to the pandemic. The MCH division encourages you to get your children ages 12 years and older vaccinated. I want the COVID vaccine, give me the COVID vaccine. They save mommy, the vaccine save, save, save. Brought to you by the Virgin Islands Department of Health MCH program. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey, you. Hey, babe. Thanks for lunch. You're welcome. Who was that? That was a representative from the Virgin Islands Department of Health. They're doing a survey called BRFSS. Oh, for what? It's to address chronic diseases facing the Virgin Islands. Diabetes, heart and kidney disease, cancer, stroke, and more. What kind of questions do they ask? They ask questions about food, exercise, age, smoking, and some others. Is that all they ask? Do they ask questions about... Security? No. They don't ask anything about social security, money, or credit card information. The information that they do collect is used to guide public health programs that affect all of us. You, me, the kids, the community, and the entire Virgin Islands. Oh, okay. Very interesting. I'm glad we could do our part to help. Yes, we've got to do our part. For more information, visit our website or call John Orr at 340-643. 
Welcome back. Being diabetic doesn't mean that you don't enjoy life. First daughter, Aliyah Bryan, is a testament to that. She is an entrepreneur, cum laude college graduate, and businesswoman who is fortunate to have a supportive circle of friends and family. And as you remember, when we were speaking with First Lady Bryan, Yolanda Bryan, she spoke about the close-knit family encounters that they had that supported both of them through diabetes and the diagnosis. And so, Aliyah, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Happy that you're here with us. You traveled here for to be here? Yes, I did. So where are you living now? I live in Atlanta right okay. now. Um, I went to school there, and after I graduated, I just decided to stay. Well, welcome, welcome back home. Thank you. And I'm happy that you're here um, for Thanksgiving as well. Yes, so am I. I'm sure your mom and dad are <laughs> yes. so happy that you're here. They're always happy to have me <laughs> home, always. <laughs> okay, so talk to me a little bit about diabetes. I know that um, you were diagnosed a little bit before you were 12 years old. Mm -hmm. But what did that mean to you So at that age? At that age, um, I mean, as you all know, when you're 12 years old, that's a pretty pivotal point in your life. Um, it was a couple weeks before I started middle school. Um, when you're 12 years old, you're worried about, you know, making friends and fitting in. And being a diabetic, having diabetes just seemed like something else that would get in the way of me being like everyone else. Um, so for a long time, I, I think I was in this period of like in denial. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd kind of convinced myself that if I didn't acknowledge it, it didn't exist. And my mom would always get upset at me. She'd be like, do your friends know you have diabetes? And I'd be like, no, <laughs> because I, it was all of for fear that I'd be treated differently, even adults. And I think the general population doesn't have a good grasp on what it is that diabetes is what it entails, um, which is part of the reason why we're having this conversation right. today. Um, because even, even adults, when they found out that I had diabetes, I did notice that they treated me a little bit differently. And I didn't feel like it hindered me at all. Of course, I took it to an extreme where I did everything that I wanted to do, but the bottom line was I still was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And the inconvenient truth was that I had a chronic illness that I would have for the rest of my life. Okay, so you were afraid to tell your friends. Yeah, really and, anyone. And a lot of children that age, because they're afraid to tell their friends, may do things or eat things that they may not normally want to eat because they know, they know, you knew mm -hmm. what you, your limits were. Mm -hmm. I know your, your parents, Dr. Roman, your pediatrician, sat down and spoke with you about what you can and can't eat. Mm -hmm. But how did you, because and I want the children that's listening to this to really, to, to listen to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Were you able to separate yourself and say, you know what, even though um, Joanne was, is, is, is eating an ice cream cone at this, or maybe two ice cream cones, I know what I can and I cannot do. Did you partake or were you strong enough, at, even at 12, to step back and say, I can't? So one thing they tell you, and I should say they, um, doctors, diabetes educators will tell you is that you can live a regular life. Everything just has to be in moderation. So it wasn't that I couldn't eat the cake. Um, it was just maybe I had half of the cake or maybe I just had the cake without the ice cream on top. So making small modifications um, that really went a long way. Um, and that's not to say that I always did that. Um, there were times when I certainly just did what everybody else did. Um, and eventually I got to a point where I figured out what worked for me. But I think when I was young, um, I, I wasn't nearly as uh, accountable for the actions that I took. Rightly so. I mean, right. you don't think about it 12 years old. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, me as a 24-year-old diabetic is much different mm -hmm. from me as a 15, 16-year-old diabetic. Um, my mom could tell you. Um, we got in so many arguments uh, over my health. Um, while other kids got their phone taken away for getting bad grades or sneaking out, I got my phone taken away because I wasn't checking my blood sugar. I was lying about what I was eating or if I ate at all. How did your mom help you to understand what you should and shouldn't be doing and, and the rationale behind of it? Um, 
I think in general, my mother has always instilled... But wait, we're speaking about your mommy and your mommy right here, but I know your daddy has something to do with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, in general, my mom, as she said before, she was just more of a health-conscious person. I think she has really um, spearheaded the, what should I call it, the healthy eating lifestyle yeah. in my house. <laughs> um, because, yeah, the rest of us, I don't think would be eating the way we eat if it weren't for her. Um, so I think that- I I'll, think she just thanked you. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of, uh, even the eating habits that I've had from growing up um, carried over into college with me. Um, people nice. around me, hear. yeah, people around me would be like, oh yeah, like, Aaliyah loves salads. Aaliyah's always making salads. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's my mom. Because I, I figured out way to make salads mm -hmm. less boring. Um, just my food in general. Yeah. Um, Isn't it exciting, though, that she's actually making a cookbook? Yeah. Um, I know she doesn't want to divulge, but I'm really interested in hearing yeah, yeah, yeah. what's um, going on. <laughs> I've, um, I've seen um, a couple of the recipes. So, yeah, it's exciting. And I'm looking forward for it to, to come out and try some of them. I've taste tested a couple of things, but I'm excited for it to come out. Okay, so before even speaking about what you're doing after college, talk about how you transition into college as a diabetic. Um, so but let me let me rephrase that because I'm learning, you know, from from uh, for others. How would you speak about going into college with someone living with diabetes? So I think that when, so when I first went to college. And all through high school, you know, I already said that, you know, my mom and I really went through a lot um, because I was still in this stage of denial. And mm -hmm. when you're young and your body is resilient and it bounces back from anything, mm -hmm. you kind of convince yourself that no matter what I do, I'm good. Mm -hmm. And when you feel good, when you can see and, you know, you're able to walk and your body's not giving out on you, you'll continue to do things that are not good for you. Um, so I kind of continued to cut corners in college. Um, and what I really needed to realize and that what I realized maybe a little too late or a little later than I should, um, is that when I crossed the stage and received my high school diploma, my life would have never been the same again. So certain things that I was doing mm -hmm. needed to change. Um, and I had to kind of tweak, um, certain things to adjust to this new life that I had just started. You, you spoke about, um, well, I guess invincible is, is, a, is a word that came to me, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. And most teenagers think they are invincible. Yep. True? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Okay, sure. absolutely. When did you find, because there are certain illnesses that occur, um, you're predisposed to certain illnesses as, a di as someone who's living with diabetes. Mm -hmm. What happened in your life that actually caused you to think differently about diabetes, taking care of yourself more, taking it a little bit more seriously. So when I graduated from college, I started a business, um, as you already know, as many people already know. Yeah. And I was really struggling a lot with um, anxiety and stress, um, partly because I never saw myself um, founding a business, never mind a technology startup. Mm -hmm. So here I was, uh, 21 years old, uh, a young Caribbean woman um, at the table speaking with middle-aged white men. And there were these voices in my head amplifying the thoughts that I was already having by saying, you don't belong here. Mm -hmm. um, I shouldn't be here. Um, so I started getting counseling because um, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping. So these stresses were starting to manifest themselves physically. Um, and that's when I really saw my health start to, start to take a turn for the worse. Um, I actually passed out while driving. I was in rush hour traffic, got off the freeway and passed out because it was five o'clock and I hadn't eaten for the day. Um, so when your parents get a phone call saying that, you know, your kid is unconscious, um, that's scary. When you start to see the decisions that you are making or your lack of attention to your health start to affect your friends and your family, that's when I started to get to the point where I was like, okay, something has to change. And, and um, the stress also increases your hormones. It increases the use of your energy. Right. And then, of course, that, that is a cyclical event. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. 
Before we go to a break, and we will be going to a break shortly, but I want you to say to the, to the listeners, you and audience, what is it that you would say to young men and young women um, in reference to those living with diabetes? Uh, number one, um, the sooner that you acknowledge that you are a diabetic, this is something that you're going to have for the rest of your life, and you start to take steps to benefit your health, um, the better. Number two, allow yourself grace. I mean, we're human. We're all fallible. We all have the capacity to slip back into bad habits. Um, it has not been a steady uphill climb. It's been more of a trot with lots of peaks and valleys. Um, and you have to allow yourself room to fall down and get back up again. Number three, if you're a student um, living with diabetes, seek out counseling. Utilize your school's counseling services. I know many schools do that now. Um, talk to somebody. Don't allow your mental health to start to manifest itself into your physical and affect you. Those are Thank my top you. Three. Counseling Thank you. is very important. Yeah. That's a big one. Thank you so much, um, both of you, for coming on and speaking. Pleasure. Uh, you know, when we spoke before we started, uh, you both said how difficult that this. Um, has been over the years and difficult actually coming out to speak about you yourself living with diabetes and you and the family living with someone who is living with diabetes. And that can't be easy. It and we have easy. so many people that is in within the Virgin Islands who's doing this right now, right. whether it's type 1, type 2, or gestational diabetes. Right. So really and truly, thank you so much, both of you, for sharing your thoughts and at providing the encouragement that we need in the community. It's my Thank pleasure you. to be Thank here. You. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Thank you so much. Virgin Islands veterans, I'm standing here on Veterans Drive, built in honor of us, Virgin Islands veterans. But we now must do our part to bring more VA medical benefits to our shores. How can we do that, you may ask? Get on www.va.gov and get registered. This is the way that we can do our part. Get registered at www.va.gov. We're counting on you. Welcome back. I was actually privileged to, and honored to have the First Lady and First Daughter here with us. But in the, right now I have to say that I'm truly privileged because I have some experts here with me today um, that's gonna be speaking to us a little bit more about diabetes. And um, I'm gonna start, start with you. Um, tell us a little bit, tell us who you are, because I'm excited for them to know what you do and um, your name, who you are, and we'll go from there. I'm Desiree James, I'm a registered nurse, and I'm also a certified diabetes educator, one of two in the Virgin Islands. That's what I'm excited yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> we actually had you were the only one for a, a period of time. Yes, and then Dr. Um, Letitia Henry, she became certified a couple years yes, ago. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. so I, rem I remember when yeah. you became certified as a diabetes educator. I was at the hospital at that point in time, but your name was, no, you, were, you were noted, let's put it this way. So congratulations for not yep. just getting it, but keeping up with Maintaining it. Maintaining it, yeah. Yeah, and as a result of that, you've actually helped a lot of families. And from what I've been told, you actually helped the First Lady, uh, First Lady Yolanda, as well as Aliyah, yes. with um, Aliyah's diabetes. Yeah, she was one of my babies. She came to my house lots. <laughs> <laughs> We had lots of candid conversations that I won't share with her mom or dad. <laughs> <laughs> Even 20, 10 years later, I still won't share that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she was one of my, um, I call them my babies, because I've dealt with several um, children with diabetes. And I've done it all just because. Because? Yeah. Um, just tell me a little bit. Uh, we, we said that this is National Diabetes Month, right? OK. so. I want you to define, um, in just short words, what's the difference between type one, type two, and gestational diabetes? The difference is basically the, the age that you're diagnosed. Because with type one diabetes, the pancreas produces no insulin. 
somebody with type 1 diabetes has to be on insulin to control their blood sugar levels. Um, type 2 diabetes generally used to be an older um, population that developed type 2 diabetes. But that's actually changed. In the last 10 years, mm -hmm. almost 50% of the children, especially here in the Virgin Islands, that have developed diabetes have type 2 diabetes. 70% of the people that develop diabetes, type 2 diabetes, develop diabetes because of being overweight or obese. So that tells us this is something that's preventable. So basically the difference is with type 1 and type 2 is your body in type 1 produces no insulin. You're typically diagnosed at a younger age, usually, like you said, six months um, to young adulthood, you're generally um, diagnosed. Type 2 diabetes is where your pancreas produces some insulin, but your body doesn't use it as it should. Um, type 2, like, like First Lady said, Aliyah's symptoms came on rapidly. That's one of the, the, the differences with the mm -hmm. type 1 and the type 2. And type 2 diabetes, it's a gradual onset. People typically have type 2 diabetes for five years before, they before they're ever diagnosed. diagnosed because it's that gradual. And with the type 2 diabetes, um, it's progressive. So people tend to end up on insulin anyway because it is a progressive condition. And gestational diabetes is where women develop diabetes while pregnant. Majority of them don't end up with diabetes after the pregnancy, but some do um, develop diabetes after delivering their baby. So if you, if you are diagnosed with... Um gestational diabetes, what's the risk for the baby? You'll have a bigger baby. Um, and bigger babies tend to develop diabetes later in life because of environmental factors, being a bigger baby. Um, and it's, it's a risk in um, just delivery because the babies tend to be so big. So that predisposes them to diabetes also. Thank you, and thank you for the work you've done with diabetes. I know that you've worked um, quite some time, but you do education not just where you work, but outside as well. Yes. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And it brings us to the Department of Health. And what is the Department of Health? Um, first of all, congratulations on your new title. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> um, well deserved. Uh, you're, you knew the um, title as a Director of Chronic Disease and, and Health Promotion or Health, Prevent, Health Promotion. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the division now that can be linked to um, supporting those living with diabetes. Sure. So we are doing self-management um, classes. There's a lot of push currently around empowering persons who are at risk for diabetes. So we focus a lot not only on prevent, um, managing diabetes, but also preventing diabetes. So we have classes for both um, pre-diabetes and persons living with diabetes. And these classes, um, range from six weeks to a year. Uh, it empowers, empowers um, individuals to eat healthier, increase physical activity, um, speak with their healthcare provider, because a lot of people who have diabetes, they're in denial, as um, Aliyah mentioned. Mm -hmm. So we encourage you to have a conversation with your healthcare provider and set a treatment plan that works for you. People often go to the doctor and they listen to the doctor, but then they go home and they do what they want. So we want people to agree with their doctor and whatever that treatment plan is and follow through. We also focus on problem solving because, I mean, little things come up here and there in your lifestyle. So in the workshops, they work with their pairs because it's a pair to pair um, class and they help each other solve problems and make decisions as it relates to um, their health. Now, one of the things that you spoke about was um, do, the education and training and, and prevention. So it's not just about preventing diabetes. It's also preventing comorbidities related to diabetes. True. What are some of the comorbidities that may develop as a result of diabetes? Right. So high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, people get stroke as a result um, of diabetes, kidney disease, so that people end up on dialysis. And then the good thing is that the risk factors are very similar. So in our classes, when we teach about healthy eating and physical activity, it affects all those com comorbidities. Uh, does, do you see a lot of individuals um, coming to you with renal problems as a result of diabetes? 
Well, I, I want to clear this up, though. The renal problems, the comorbidities come because of uncontrolled diabetes. It's not oh, just diabetes. Right. Right. Thank you. So we, we want to get it out there that it's uncontrolled diabetes. Right. Because if you control your diabetes, you tend not to have as many complications. Thank you. Thank so, you for that. Yeah. So I that's really the goal is to that. control the diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started in my job, I've been in my current position now 20, a little over 23 years. Um, when I first started, yes, I had lots of patients mm -hmm. on dialysis. It's, we don't see that as much now because people are taking better care of themselves. Excellent. And I, and I also push patients and I tell them, diabetes doesn't control you, you have to control the diabetes. It's the way you choose to live or the way you choose to die depends on how you take care of yourself now. And I promote self-care. I, when clients come to me, I said, it's not about me. It's about you. And it's about what you want to do and what you want to get out of this. It, I, I tell them, this isn't about me. It's about you. We're here for you. So the treatment plans, like Linnea said, I don't make treatment plans that fit me. Mm -hmm. I make treatment plans that fit the patient and what they're willing to do. And that makes it a lot easier but for them. To... I have to say that is a, a true sign of leadership. Um, however, um, the treatment plan does truly, and I reiterate that leadership is there because the treatment plan has to, it's all about them, mm -hmm. it's all about you, but it's all about both of you. And so they would not be able to do that if they did not have the support that they did, whether it's from um, someone who is a certified diabetes educator or a group of individuals from the Department of Health who's actually working towards the same goal. Reducing risk factors, mm -hmm. identifying risk factors so that they can be reduced, as well as having everyone understand the implication of diabetes, as well as if you are diagnosed and if you are living with diabetes, what we're trying to do is decrease the risk factors by controlling your diabetes. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm gonna turn, go 360. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why, because you, you, you keyed into something that I wanted to speak about, and that is COVID and diabetes. You know, we, we look at um, uh, COVID-19 as one of the most devastating viruses that we've seen um, in our lifetime, right? And of course, those that are, that are, um, are living with diabetes are, are exposed to COVID-19. So we've had a fair amount of those who have been uh, contracted COVID-19. Some of them have done well and others have not done well. Gus, uh, share with me your thoughts on why those with diabetes, and, and going back to your earlier conversation, what have they not done well? And those that have, what do you think they've done better? Lifestyle, really, because you, I, I find that the persons with diabetes that I take care of that do well generally with their health, they want to do better. Um, they are beyond that point of, I'm invincible, because even adults have that mentality. Or oh, this, you know, if I don't address it, it really, you know, I'm not claiming it. Mm -hmm. It's not mine. So we, we see a lot, I see a lot of that in that they say, well, I'm not claiming it, so I don't have it. And you know, they, you know Aaliyah said just that? Yeah. She said it, she said It's just very that. common, yeah. very common, even with older people diagnosed. It is a very common phenomenon. And those that do well with diabetes and with COVID, they just generally take better care of themselves. So it goes back to what you said. Yes. You have to have it under control. Yes. So, so if, even if you have contracted COVID and your diabetes is under control, your outcome is better. better. If you're, uh, if you're mm -hmm. not under control, then those comorbidities are actually gonna, uh, or linked to COVID-19, the um, symptoms are gonna be more severe because your diabetes is not under control. Under and under diabetes control. affects every organ in the in body. The body yeah. So when you have diabetes ravaging every organ and then you add COVID on that, then it's more difficult for you to recover. You know, and um, before we go, one of the things that, that I really want you to explain and just a simple cyclical um, biological explanation of how diabetes works, but I'm gonna save that. Okay. I want, um, <laughs> I want Alinea to talk to us a little bit about 
uh, what we're doing in the Department of Health. I know we had a, diabetic, a diabetes walk last week. What's coming up now and what can the general public look forward to this month and, and months beyond? So we, um, as you said, had a walk on Saturday on St. Thomas with about 100 participants. It was a great success. Um, we do, we have PSAs um, on the radio and on the television. Commissioner just um, recorded something that's mm -hmm. going to be aired. Our self-management self -management classes are going to be restarting with Desiree as one of our, <laughs> our facilitators. So when you mentioned you heard that, that so she can. She can. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so we have those coming up in January as well. And then um, one thing that's on the radar is our diabetes registry that we are working to seek funding Excellent, yes. in collaboration with the University of the Virgin Islands. Um, I'm really looking forward to that because that's going to allow us to identify persons living with diabetes and then we can offer more targeted resources. We can get a better feel of exactly how the territory is doing in regards to diabetes and provide those, that support that's needed. So I know the governor spoke um, earlier about um, we we're having a press conference next week. Yes. We're speaking about diabetes, what we public private partnership and how we can actually get the word out to the public. So everyone really stay tuned. I think it's around 10 o'clock on Monday um, so that you'd be able to hear what we're doing in terms of pub pub public private partnership and how we can get you more involved in your own care. Um, so now I'll go back to you. So just give me, give me a, just a little synopsis. How sugar goes into your body and what happens after that? Okay. Or carbohydrates, because people don't see <laughs> potato as being going People into don't see it. anything as being that. <laughs> but I, I describe it like this. Mm -hmm. Everything we eat turns to the simplest form of sugar. Well, not everything, but most, most things that we mm -hmm. eat. Our body uses that sugar as energy. So my analogy is always like a car. Mm -hmm. You need fuel for a car to run. If you don't have fuel, the car won't go anywhere. So the food we eat is the fuel for our bodies. We have parts to the car in order for certain parts to work. So we have the pancreas. The pancreas function is to produce insulin. The purpose of insulin is to absorb the sugar from foods mm -hmm. into the cells to give us the energy. What happens with diabetes, and my analogy is, you have a car, you have gas, but you have no key. So without that key, unless you're a criminal and you jump start the car, you're not going anywhere. So the key in your body unlocks your cells so the insulin can go into the cells. Your body absorbs that insulin into the cells. You have energy and your body functions. So we need all the parts. So when we eat food, we digest. It turns to sugar, and that sugar is used for energy. Thank you. Thank you for so much for that analogy. And I think it helps a lot trying to understand. I wanted the, the general public, um, Virgin Islanders out there, those listening, um, and those viewing uh, from abroad also, to really have a good understanding of what diabetes is all about, not just how it's linked to COVID, but just in general. We, we heard from the First Lady, uh, Yolanda Bryan, and Aaliyah Bryan, the first daughter. And they were not always the first lady and the first daughter. Mm -hmm. She was diagnosed as di uh, living with diabetes from the time she was 12 years old. They had to grow into this. Each and every one of you can. Don't be afraid. It's always like the question is, are you afraid or of the diagnosis or are you afraid of the treatment, of the cure, or of, of the reactions that you can actually get from outsiders? Counseling behavioral health therapy is available in the Department of Health as, as elsewhere as well. I want you to take the time to recognize diabetes as, um, as some, one of the, the six leading causes of death in the territory and take care of yourselves, everyone. Um, please, I wanna thank everyone who joined me here today, especially um, First Lady Yolanda and Aliyah and these two individuals here who are experts in the field of diabetes. It has been a pleasure being here with you. Thank you so much.